This is the AI Assisted Organization podcast with your hosts, myself, Piers Lenny, and my co-founder, Alok Shukla. Say hello, Alok. Hi, Piers. So I'm, uh, I'm in sunny, it's a bit too hot actually, Verona in Italy um, <laughs> today, hence the, hence the linen. I think uh, Alok's back in, you were in Manchester, weren't you? Were you back in? Back in Lisbon. Uh, Lisbon. And I'm off, to, I'm off to Lake Garda actually, so the next pod might be from Lake Garda next week. So we've got this crack on, let's get into it. We've got a lot to go over. So we're going to try and keep this short and snappy today. Um, so there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, where are we? And also about potentially the change in the the user interface. We've been used to this graphical user interface for many years. I've kind of grown up with it, really. Although I kind of started off with a sort of command prompt back in the day, but mostly uh, sort of GUI. And what we're seeing is this, this transition, aren't we, into sort of AI is driving that from um, basically having a computer where you ask it things and it gives you a result and you kind of iterate sort of commands, hence the name sort of command prompt, um, to a world where you're basically sharing intent or you're sharing an objective or an outcome. And then the technology, the AI in this case, goes off and does what it can, uses the resources it's got and the agency it can access and the information it can access to achieve the outcome. And that that could bring about a complete change to the way in which we interact with technology. And again, I think another sort of layer on that is natural language processing. I was looking at some hype curve graph this morning on their LinkedIn and it was quite interesting saying that I think it's only things are two to five years out and that was created in January and you think it's already out of date. So we're going to see in the next you know, two to five years, probably two years more so, a, very, a big change in how we interact with technology. No, 100%. Like, I mean, basically, the, the way we're going through a platform shift right now um, the more companies that start using AI in different elements, and as I said, it's through a kind of like text interface, the more productivity they're gaining, the more they're seeing and, and needing less to use traditional kind of like GUI softwares and things like this. So I think the key thing is like most of the time where we were like hunting around with the mouse to kind of do different things, as we move faster towards like intent things where we specify what we want and then it's de delivered in a specific way, you know, different AI workflows, automations, it's just going to make things easier and easier as we shift away from the platform, window, keyboard model of everything. And I think today we're still quite, we're getting used to the idea of a chatbot, you know, it's still a flipping <laughs> keyboard, which, and I keep saying this, that given that the, the voice recognition technology is so good now, you know, OpenAI, Whisper, there's lots of other ones, Google as well, and are now a meta actually. And I still don't understand why these things are still using keyboard input. I know that a keyboard, you can use it anywhere. You can't always talk to technology wherever you are. And then we're also seeing, uh, you know, the change to multimodal. So you'd be able to yeah. show it things or it can be able, eventually be able to smell things, hear things, um, see things, read things. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm always amazed at why the technology and all these thousands of AI SaaS companies aren't kind of focusing on this. Now that's going to come next year. Like I think multimodal input, like for example, already what you can do is imagine you had your email campaign, like an email sequence you're sending to your customers. Um, you could already load those emails into GPT or other LLMs and you could get it reviewed for, you know, give me better um, open subject lines, give me better, you know, content um, headless and all these kind of things. But next year, it'll also be able to look at the photo and the video within the email. And that will also be able to then give you a better version or a better clip from that. So it's definitely coming. I think the key thing is you have to kind of get started already integrating into your workflow because, you know, you you build on top of things. It's just about like layering different technologies, really. I think, and let's move on to, um, well, clip that. let's move on to, you know, my favorite subject, uh, SaaS, software as a service and, and micro SaaS as well. And one of the things is, and I, I was saying before, there's hundreds and hundreds of these AI SaaS companies being um, funded. And I wrote an article about this on LinkedIn about is it the end of SaaS or the billions going into it? It won't be in all cases, but I think that, and I said this again before, that this world of where these SaaS companies are going after the largest market in that kind of bell curve at the top, where it tends to be the most generic kind of products in some ways. And then, I mean, something that Salesforce about decades to evolve, but many have that kind of, they go for the mass market. Then they add on suboptimal features, yeah. you know, um, to their solution, like sales automation, just customer service and blah, blah, blah. And then what you're getting are solutions that they kind of work, but they're never quite right. And that's what you hear most from um, small, medium sized enterprises. And what we're probably working, moving towards now is a world where you have these super powerful platforms. Increasingly, there are kind of proprietary ones. You can have open source ones as well. 
but you access them. Then now you can build, this is what we're kind of working with some companies, you can build your own micro apps, micro SaaS, whatever you want to call it, that are specific to your business, your needs, your workflows, and uh, you know your objectives. And that means they add incredible value. And also means you can evolve them over time. Now, we always talk about, don't we, where does every company become a software development house or the companies like Implement AI, do they do that for them? Do they outsource it? But you're going to get into this constant cycle of, iterative sort of change and evolution, which could be quite draining in time for lots of companies. But I think that's where SaaS is going. And you'll use these kind of generic SaaSes, the ones that are very good, the ones that are, you know, they've, they've evolved over time, they're quite mature, where they add a lot of value. But around the periphery, especially the edge cases where it's quite hard to automate, that's where AI and um, these micro SaaS is going to kick in. No, definitely. And I'll give an example. These days, because of like a lot of these no code softwares, or you've got like, for example, like different APIs, which can be linked together, you can literally string together the use cases you want. So I was playing yesterday with um, a habit tracker I came across, and this was really quite interesting. Um, basically, it was like a, a program built by the, this, this small group of people. And essentially, it works through WhatsApp and you it's there to try and guide you to do your habits. Now, this could easily be the front end for some kind of like coaching business or something else like that. You you have the ability now that for any kind of t business to create a kind of like technology solution, which can help engage customers more. And that's just one example. And it works quite nicely. And I got a text this morning through WhatsApp asking me three questions about my habits. But in the same way, you can create your own SaaS, which would then, let's say, for example, help you generate your YouTube clips or generate your blog posts, or you can load in a video that you recorded and it can help you turn that into like a, a PDF or ebook. So I think the, the, the kind of generic SaaS is going to be changed and fragmented down into specific use cases that you want to use in your business. And I think that's where it is about becoming AI assisted. It's just about how you can have more of those kind of workflows within your business, basically. But what's your view? Do you think people are going to go buy the micro SaaS and pay you know, 20 quid a month? I, mean, I don't know how many subscriptions I've got going at the moment. I'm going to have to go through them because it's like, <laughs> there must be about 50 of them just testing stuff. I think people are going to go and buy that or do you think they're going to develop it? I think I think it's a combination because there's quite a few um, basically components that you can subscribe to. And then from those components, you can make five or six different products from it. But there will be some situations where someone's put together something clever and useful enough that, that it's just worthwhile just having. So I think I think it's going to kind of go away from like, you know, some of the really expensive, bigger SaaS companies and products to much more specific things. I think it'll be a hybrid, to be honest, like the companies that get, that have stuff assembled for themselves and um, through like components, which enable you to do that. And at the same time, some specific kind of like industry and um, specific softwares. I think that, that's the way it will just evolve, really. I think the, the real value is, and, and talk about the AI assisted organization, the real value is, is going to be there's really sort of sticky, complex workflows that you're still doing. You know, there's tape, string, humans, people wasting time. So many people have said to us over the last sort of two months or so that they have got very intelligent, capable, ambitious young people um, working and doing things all day long that must be mind numbing, yeah. just translating data, filling things out, filling forms. And, and if you can automate that, you're going to be able to access talent, make them more productive and keep them no i agree i agree um so let's move on to there's been a lot of uh, quite a few articles and uh, i mean a lot of these things are quite esoteric in some ways but they they do sort of paint the picture of where this is going and again it's all a question of horizons and time frame and um there's a couple of articles and uh, videos I, i've watched about large language models where the world's going mark andresen you know the founder of um, one of the founders of andresen horowitz and the you know, the guy that developed Netscape, essentially. He wrote a famous essay, I think it was 2011, called Software Will Eat the World. Um, quite a long essay. Uh, that kind of set the scene for sort of web, or where would that be, in sort of web.2, web.3 as, as well. And I've been saying that AI is now eating software. So it's kind of like, you know, it's come full circle almost. And there's this ongoing, you know, conversation we don't need to get into on, on this podcast, really, about um, alignment to some extent, about, you know, is AI going to be aligned with, are the machines going to be aligned with humans? And he wrote a 7,000 word essay about the, the benefits of AI, the, the, the positives. And that goes from, you know, society, so I've got a list here, to the impact on employment. He thinks that AI is not going to, you know, it will, it will disrupt some roles, some jobs, but it's going to create others. 
He thinks in business, you're not going to end up, you know, five massive companies with five trillionaires running the world. He thinks that AI is going to empower everybody to be able to start a business, to be able to automate the mundane and focus on the, as I always say, move up that value pyramid to the top and focus on adding a huge amount of value. Developments, you know, you won't, be, you won't need to be able to code now. You'll be able to code in sort of talking to technology or a computer, whatever it might be, using um, natural language. And also he's on the... Um, Lex Fridman podcast as well, and he kind of brought it all together. And he thinks that the key to this really is not having proprietary um, models. It's um, having basically an, an open source community. Some are always going to be proprietary because people want to hang on to it and they're investing tens of million dollars into it. But eventually it all needs to be open source because then it's something that, you know, everyone can access and everyone can benefit from. Yeah, because the thing is, you don't want to have um, LLMs which are like optimized and tuned to particular worldviews necessarily. You want to have things which are as broad and representative as possible. One of the nice things about LLMs is that they actually give quite good nuance and quite give pers quite good perspective. He was talking about in that podcast how you can get it to debate, let's say, um, communism and fascism and it will end and then the two the two views can then debate each other and then you can also make it so that they don't actually um go to agree they actually kind of become more disagreeing and so the point i'm trying to make is that you can actually have access to broader perspectives than maybe the social media era which became a kind of echo chamber so the thing is it's very important that you want ai models that understand the broadness of the reality and it's not tuned to a particular worldview and then Otherwise, then that becomes dangerous because people start getting a restricted view of reality, basically. But I think the interesting uh, use case there is, is not so much comparing, you know, different economic or political models. It's if you've got a customer that's got an issue and you're in a disagreement with them or an employee or any any issue in a business where there's friction, yeah. you can set them up to be both sides of the argument. Absolutely. Play the arguments out in different ways, see what the outcomes are or likely outcomes. And then in the real world, you can then use that to, you know, to sort of maybe use the path of least resistance. No, I agree with you. And I think this is this is where LLMs can almost bring back that whole that whole judgment and that whole balance. I mean, basically, they're a smart assistant. Everyone's got access to a smart assistant now, you know, and, and, that, and that smart assistant can help them understand the world in ways they could never do that before. And I think this just brings more balance to everyone. And I think in the typical, he's American, so they don't want any regulation, which I think isn't going to happen. You've already seen that EU, there's going to be some regulation. We talked about this last week, depending on the, the potential impact and the, the danger of that um, artificial intelligence. So they're going to sort of regulate it in different ways. So he thinks, so, you know, this, this wobble there. so he thinks this should be um, regulated in terms of, well, having no regulation, but only really where the specific like military uses. Um, Gosh, do that all again. I'm going to do that all again, Mr. Editor. Are you ready? <clears throat> um, okay. Right. And he made, he made the important point, he's American, that um, regulation could have uh, unintended consequences. Now, I don't think we're going to avoid regulation because in the EU, we're already seeing you know, the EU law sort of going through. But it, it is they are trying to sort of segment AI. And again, the boundaries are going to be very, very difficult to work out in terms of what is the danger. Is it military or is the impact on your children? You know, which, is, which is more... Uh, which has a more negative impact on society. So he he thinks that regulations would be an issue and we need to make sure that doesn't happen. I don't know if that's going to be the case. So finding that balance between the regulators, especially, I think, we're working on regulated sectors, so law, wealth management, accounting, is when, when do the regulators begin to believe in and uh, understand that this technology, in may, most cases, or many cases, is going to have better outcomes with less risk than humans. No, I, I agree. And and I think the whole thing that Mark Andreessen is talking about is the competition with China, for example, right? And it's just like not losing that kind of superpower battle. But I agree, there's going to need to be like some kind of regulation in this. But this is, we're still in the very early, early stages of this. So it's going to kind of evolve. And as we play out, we'll see different use cases evolve from there. So let's move on to, um, again, we've touched on this quite a lot, but it's SEO, search, where it's going, development of it, how that's going to impact businesses. I mean, there's a whole enormous sector globally looking at you know, digital marketing and SEO. And this conversation is sort of raging, but you're already seeing the sort of impact yeah. of um, AI and chatbots on search, and, and they're the basic ones. And I was, I was doing a bit of research on looking at Bing because when Bing launched with um, this sort of open AI backend and some Microsoft, like I think Microsoft does the uh, translation, for example, 
everyone thought, oh, no, Bing's going to really eat into Google's um, um, sort of market prowess. And that's not been the case. It seemed to have peaked during the initial hype of sort of 9% of the market. Google's about 87%. And then Bing seems to have fallen back to sort of 7%. So you haven't kind of seen that massive migration away from search yet. But I think that is coming. And that's where the multimodal ability to in interact with this technology is going to change things. So again, what's your view on SEO? Because I've got, I've, got, I've got a view on it and then the timing of it. And also the idea behind having a website generally and um, search. Yeah, no, definitely. So things are going to become more fragmented. Um, basically, like as an example, there's a website called Stack Overflow, which is essentially a website which has lots of questions and answers for developers. And so developers used to use that very heavily to ask questions and find out answers to programming quest um, issues. And they have their web traffic down 30% as of March this year. And generally March is supposed to be like a quite a good month for web traffic and they're down overall. And, and the reason they're down is because most people are now not using Stack Overflow to find answers. They're using different LLMs, they're using, you know, um, GitHub Copilot and different things. So I think the way people are trying to find answers and the way people were using search is going to fragment more and more. So then it becomes interesting because like, if people aren't incentivized to create content on Stack Overflow or different places because they're not going to get reward in different ways. Things things will kind of like change over time. So I think I think what's going to happen over time is like Google at the moment is going to show you you know like the answers and then potentially some of the links which will be clickable. But then the question will become like how do you optimize for the language model? How do you optimize for brand and for awareness and recommendation? So. I think things are going to change away from the tightly measured area where in the past you could know exactly which keyword was what. I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but like Google Analytics is literally changing next week and it's, it's been getting worse and worse over time. So your ability to kind of like measure and understand what's going on because of the changes that Apple did with the cookies and everything like that, it's just shifted. So I think we're moving into an area where Google is still dominant place where people start, but how people will get answers and how that's going to turn out over time, I think that's going to evolve. I think Mark Andreessen was saying in the podcast, Lex Fidman as well, that um, you, because everyone's saying that the, the website is going to disappear, you don't need it anymore. You see the database of images, product pricing. Um, and he was saying, well, you, you kind of need the web in some ways, because if you think about the large language models, they were trained on web pages. Yeah. So if you have no new web pages, what the hell are you going to train these large language models on? So that was quite an interesting um, sort of take on it. But I think, I think you're right in that the, I mean, my, I mean, my own experience now, you know, I'm in, I'm in Italy. I went to the opera, went to see Carmen the other night, as you do, with my mum, to my mum. And um, I was like, well, I need to understand this in case there's no subtitles, which there were, luckily. And you know, I, I, don't, I don't go and search anymore. I'm straight into chat GPT, uh, GPT-4. And I ask for a summary of a certain length. Uh, I want a bit of context as well. And boom, there it is, and I read it, and I'm done. I don't... I, I don't really use search engines anymore. And the point here is, is, is let's talk about business, is that you're now seeing, you know, we'll come on to this in a moment, but, you know, Dropbox and various other document stores are now putting a almost like a, a GPT over the top of this. So now you can interrogate your own company data. Yeah. So the idea of now of search within your company data is now going to change as well, where you can just ask it questions and get the outcome, you well, the, the, the information you need formatted in the way you want it. That's one way of looking at it. <laughs> I mean, you were saying you've got, you know, electricity, internet, and now intelligence. Um, and the question is just is just going to be is how quickly can you how quickly can you deploy this yeah. in your organisation? And what is the path of least resistance? Uh, and what what platform setup you know you're using Microsoft? You know, because Copilot, for example, or is it going to be Google? I think they're going to call it Duet. Is it going to be Dropbox? There's going to be lots of other ones as well. Is what do you use to get you to that, the, the, the current optimal point to make you the most competitive business in your sector? No, I, I agree. I agree. And, it, and, it, and it's just like, you just can't ignore it. You just have to like start looking at like, how can you can just embrace it in different areas and leveraging your own data is the key thing here, isn't it? It's like getting better and better and more, more nuanced. So let's move on to you were in Manchester um, last week. Um, which is my kind of hometown in many ways, went to Manchester, Manchester University. But you were there for an AI conference. You kind of flew in from Lisbon. Yep. It's also Father's Day, got to see your dad. It was quite it was exactly. good timing. So talk us through that, because you're saying there were quite a few interesting um, um, 
conversations came out of that? Yeah, absolutely. So I was in I was in Manchester for the Digital Leaders AI conference, and it was very interesting. So we had speakers from government. Uh, we had the head of AI from BT. We had people from Macmillan um, Cancer Care, which they had a they've got an all whole digital innovation department, which was interesting. And and basically. The, the conference was a one day conference and it was exploring the impact of AI on society and business. And I was on the business panel in the afternoon. And it was very interesting because I could see that there was like, um, there was a lot of people asking good questions where they were trying to understand, you know, like what are the implications of this or that? And then I was asking a couple of questions where it was like, look, if you want to have completely private model, you can do that. Um, it's just that there's a cost implication to that and an accuracy implication because you're going to have to maintain it and do it in that way. And then everyone had a balanced view on it and they were trying, they were understanding that like the key thing is really to kind of get ROI. And if everybody is, if everybody's kind of applying this in, in, in a similar way, I think it's just going to kind of move away from this kind of like doubt and hesitation phase. But what was really interesting is like they were talking about, like for example, Macmillan were talking about how, how they're looking at like using it to potentially support doctors and then potentially even supporting patients because I didn't know this, like if someone gets cancer, basically they have their bills go up by about 900 pounds a month, essentially, because of um, so many different elements and visiting the hospital and different things like this. And, and you know, simple things like an, a, a, a assistant, which could help someone navigate those things and answer questions based on like that journey, you know, an AI assistant, things like that. So there's so many ways that that could really help. BT were there talking about, they were showing something very interesting about Wembley Stadium, how they could map in real time all the mobile phones that were coming into the stadium, out of the stadium at lunchtime when all the cards were being tapped on. So it's quite interesting. And then we had some other um, lectures about um, security issues and different things. But but overall, everyone was really positive and there were some really interesting um interesting groups and conversations and yeah we're looking at doing an event in manchester you know later in this year so you know watch this space you know so why so you know in last december or january even march there was never going to be an ai event in manchester like this so who who had the who convened it? Where, where did it come from? What was the point of it? So there's an organization called Digital Leaders and they basically run different conferences and they were running a, a conference which was all about like innovation and digital leadership within different companies and governments and things like this. And they just added an AI day on top of that, basically. So that, that's, how, that's how that worked. And was it, I mean, you were saying that a lot of it is still quite esoteric. It's a bit like we, we try and avoid here and implement on our podcast, but you know, you've got to, you need that context. But was it kind of esoteric or was it practical? Um, I think there was a mixture of both. Like on the panel that I was, I was trying to give as practical res um, results and, 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 and examples as possible. Um, but, but at the same time, there's a lot of people that are still at the discussion and evaluation phase. So in larger organizations, like they tend to just be exploring and having discussion conversations. They haven't got around to necessarily implementing yet. So you could see that with the larger organizations, it was really quite esoteric. But, you know, on the business panel, there were some really nice, quite practical examples that were being given. Right. OK, good. So look out for our event in Manchester. We're not sure when that's going to be. It'll probably be Q3 this year, 2023. Uh, we'll, we'll share details as soon as we've firmed that one up. So let's move on to um, sort of AI news. And, and there's been quite a lot. I mean, you've had a stable diffusion of SD, SDXL 0.9. Um, so they've launched uh, the latest version of that. They've also got mid journeys. I don't know if you know what these things are, but it's kind of text to images. And stable diffusion is, is a model that lots of other people use, but they kind of fine tune it. So mid journey 5.2. And one of the big tests to hands. So if you look at a lot of people, you know, taking the Mickey out of AI, it was the fact that anyone in a photograph, a human had like, you know, six fingers or two hands or the hand was attached to the leg or whatever it might be. And uh, I think I was playing, I was testing a game. So I was I was trying to do like a, a manicured hand model holding a, a cup of coffee now for an advert, a photo, realistic photo. And uh, stable diffusion, there's still a few issues with fingers pointing in odd directions. But mid-journey, I have to say, um, seems to have cracked it. You know, there's a few issues, but you could tweak it. But very quickly, you could get a, a photograph where you'd be happy putting it on your website or in some corporate materials with um, human hands in it. So I think you're you're seeing the, the rapid evolution of the, these things that are, are sort of changing, evolving. And I, I talk about text to image quite a lot because over the years, I've spent, you know, thousands of pounds probably. And if you're a small business, it adds up quite quickly on stock imagery. So, and, and also stock video imagery. Now that's not quite mm -hmm. there yet. If you're going to look at the latest version of um, Runway, it's, that's not quite there yet. But text to image is, and I think that 
if you've got a need for a photograph or corporate materials, a website, whatever it might be, you can now create it in most cases on the fly and save yourselves that money. No, 100%. And, and I think that that's, it's quite stunning like what's possible within mid journey within those images and then they added in even the zoom out factors as well isn't it like you can create those images and you can zoom out to see the picture in in a bigger way and i've seen where places where they've actually then taken those mid journey images and created youtube shorts from them because you then have like you know a series of the images you then have like let's say a voiceover which is done by 11 labs or something like this and you've already got your almost kind of like stock video type feel essentially created yourself from those things so it's very exciting the kind of tools and the building blocks that any business has i mean anyone that's like trying to sell someone on some kind of future vision of let's say what your house is going to look like or what your new property that's going to be built is going to look like or what your holiday is going to look like or anything like that the more you can emotionally engage someone with that specific outcome the better it's going to be and and these tools literally allow you to do that for basically nothing you know it's it's quite insane the power I was playing with, a, I'm in Verona, like I said, and uh, I was trying to do a drone shot over the arena here. And, uh, you know, it's not quite the same arena. It's, it's using lots of different versions of an arena. But um, it was flippy. It was pretty good, I have to say. Wow. Uh, so the other one, which you mentioned there, is um, which I, I, I play with quite a lot, is um, like voice cloning. So text to voice, either a, a, kind of a voice that's provided for you, or in my case, I've been trying to clone my voice. So I've used things like, you mentioned 11 Labs. Yep. There's one called uh, Play.sh as well. There's, a, there's about 10 of them that are they're pretty good. Meta has now brought out one, which apparently, which I don't fully understand, but it, I don't need to understand it, but it needs two seconds of your voice to clone it. Whereas things like Eleven Labs, they want it up to 30 minutes. And they, they're getting better. And the one I was playing with last night, this Play.sh, is, is it's even got your breathing in it. And it, it's got the kind yeah. of... A lot of them are quite sort of monotone. You don't get the ups and downs and that, that, that inflection, you know, you get, you don't, you don't get that. But this one is, it's kind of playing. It doesn't always get it quite right, but that text to speech. And especially if you can clone your own voice where no one can actually tell the difference, that's super powerful for your customers, for your staff, for training. And, and it is getting there. I think by the beginning of next year, a lot of these things, and some of them are free, that you don't need to pay for. Uh, we're going to be almost there. No, I mean, like, leaving, like, voice WhatsApp messages or, you know, even if you did a training video and then say, let, let's say, for example, some parts of the training changed, and rather than recording the whole video, you can actually just overdub yourself using some of these softwares where it will literally, you write in the new changes and it will do those changes. So I think it's so powerful um, for 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 just enhancing the customer journey, enhancing training, and, you know, it's, it's really cool what, what's possible now. You saw that Synthesia a couple of weeks ago now, they raised about $100 million. These are the ones that do the avatars, and there's quite a few of them now. There's one, there's another one in um, it's Hey Gen, I think, which we mentioned before, which you can access through ChatGPT as a plugin. So if the avatar, and you can get an avatar made yourself, you haven't got to use some one that they provide, it costs you about, about one and a half thousand pounds or dollars, depending on where you are. And you, they create an avatar of you, the kind of 3D image you, and you get a very good avatar of yourself. And if your voice cloning is perfect, you can be in many different places at, at one time now. It's a, it's, a, it's a massive game changer. And the, and the other one which is quite interesting is, is in terms of AI news is things like Dropbox. So we mentioned it earlier that Dropbox now is saying, look, you can ingest. I've used one for my peers bot on my website called Ingest AI. There's a few of them. So you ingest data and you see them evolve over time. You ingest data, usually transcripts. So transcripts of videos, um, LinkedIn articles and whatever other information you've got, you upload it, and then you can search and interrogate it as if it just like you do with ChatGPT. So Dropbox are launching this. Um, we know that Microsoft are going to have this in uh, Microsoft 365 through Copilot. So a lot of these sort of SaaS companies that we talked about earlier where they're developing these sort of micro solutions, things like this, the big players are very quickly adding that functionality across their stack. And I wonder what impact that's going to have on these sort of small SaaS companies. No, I completely agree. I mean, like, if you've already using things like Dropbox, you've got all your data in there and they suddenly unlock different things. I mean, Evernote was an example. I didn't know that Evernote had some new AI upgrades. I use Evernote quite a lot. And um, my friend was showing me when I was in Manchester saying, just upgrade, just update your app. And so I did do that. And then straight away, there was um, contextual search visible within Evernote. So I could then see different elements. And it's just, you know, things, these things are just going to get better and better. And you can also like write a note and you can use the AI to clean it up. So 
as these tools just become more more and more easy and potentially like taking in dictation different things it's just going to be more effortless to kind of like just produce and organize your thoughts really and the other one which kind of dawned on me being in italy i don't speak italian i can kind of get by in english just about and in german um but is the frustration of not being able to communicate and one of the one of the ways and you see this on youtube you know mr beast you know he's he's producing his channel now and he's got actually voice actors uh, uh, sort of overdubbing his his voice into his videos but now youtube have uh their, i guess partner with called allowed they're going to introduce some um, voice automated voice dubbing in different languages so in business which obviously this, this is going to arrive very quickly you can now you know it's going to be cultural difference of things you need to understand in terms of communicating in different languages but the language itself is going to mean that you know and one of the big pains almost of, of rolling out a business and growing in different markets is language but very soon that's not going to be an issue you're going to be able to translate text on the page documents interrogate them in different languages using a gpt you're going to be able to now overdub any speech or video into any language for any market so in many ways, this is going to open up the world and, and different markets to companies of almost any size. No, I mean, that's that's insane. Like, if you think about, like, the complexity before involved in, like, translating, creating different versions of things or, you know, like, even for, like, for videos or for websites and everything. And the fact that, like, this is going to almost become, like, that layer where you have that rapid translation for anything, for any training video, for any any information, for any product. I think that's, that's hugely powerful. And, you know, the more businesses that are able to, like, expand and target different niche groups, the better they're going to do. And let's, let's finish on, we'll keep this on short and sweet today. So AI of the week, really. Now, I play with a lot of these. I've got about 100 subscriptions going. I hate seeing what it's costing me. But um, but the ones that really fascinate, the ones that interest me, the ones where they just completely change your, your productivity. And um, I was sort of, we were talking with a chap who make, makes his podcast for us. And I would look at different solutions in terms of auto editing. And there's a few of them, but there's one called Autopod. And this was an example where, you know, if I'm an editor or I've edited podcasts myself and you have to go through saying this, this one is, um, we're recording using um, Riverside. So we're between, flipping between each other. In some case, you might have, we might be in the same room, might be three cameras, one on Alot, one on myself, one on the whole scene. And one from another, maybe another angle as well to make it interesting. So when you're trying to cut those, whenever it flips, you imagine every single cut, that's a big job. And we're using one called um, Autopod, where it literally, you, I, I use it in Premiere Pro, you upload it, you then apply the AI, and it looks at where the speech is coming from and who the speaker is, because you, you tell it. And it just literally, you can literally watch it, edit the video in real time. So a half an hour video, you're probably looking at maybe, I don't know, one and a half minutes of it going through editing. You've got to go through and check it, make sure that it hasn't got anything wrong. But it's saving you literally probably two to three hours work by pressing a button. Uh, and that's that's amazing. And the other one for me really this week, is, I have to say, is Mid Journey 5.2. I think they really are getting there now. The, the photorealism is becoming, um, it's, it's not always, sometimes it still looks like a, a drawing or a cartoon. But the photorealism, people want that quite a lot, is almost getting there. And the fact that um, fingers and hands work means that you're more confident using these things on your corporate materials now. No, they're both fantastic. And like for the the Autopod stuff, I even heard, like heard the, the audio enhancement and they were showing that they could record even like with an iPhone from a distance and then they clicked and then turned the, the sound editing on and it sounded as if it was like a professional microphone. So that's going to have all sorts of implications for like enabling content creation for more people in more places, but it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I've done content, I've built studios, I've done it in a home, in the office. And it's a major pain when you have to clean things up. And I think I saw an example as well where I think there was um, a train or some big aircon unit in the background. It, it wasn't like a constant noise because they're quite easy to take out. Um, it was sort of a, a big bang or some ridiculous noise. And the AI just took it out. You, you couldn't tell. So by simplifying and making the production of content easier means that more businesses can do it. And I'm a big believer in content marketing. I mean, we all market as content, really. I think Elon Musk was saying that near an advert becomes to content, the more value it creates. So anyone that needs to produce content, which is anyone in business, it's becoming easier. It's becoming your, your quality can be a lot higher and uh, probably a fraction of the price. So I think we're going to we're going to leave it there today. I'm going to go and um, go up to the Lake Garden now with uh, <laughs> my mum, the family. So this is the AI assisted podcast with Implement AI, your host Piers Lee and Alex Shukla. We're going to be here again. If you haven't signed up for our event, there might be one or two seats left in London. 
and the 5th of July, please go and do that. Uh, but it might be might be full by the time this podcast is um, as recorded and edited and uploaded. But if not, go and have a look. And we're going to be same place, same time next week. We'll see you then. See you then.